In our quest to live the power-filled, abundant life that Yeshua came to make available, we have one of our foundational scriptures, which is found in Shaul's letters. This particular one, a letter to Timothy, and in 2 Timothy, the second letter that he wrote to his disciple, he said that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation, the salvation which comes through faith in Yeshua Messiah. He said, then all scripture, all scripture, and we again have to understand, we're just gonna transfer the words right now because from a youth, he's known the scriptures. What scriptures is it? It's the Torah. It's the prophets that point the way back to the Torah. It's the other writings that show cause and effect when Israel did not follow the Torah or when they did follow the Torah, and it shows the hand of the Almighty working in the nation that he called to be his representatives, his priests to the entire world. And when they do a bad job, they are still his representatives because it shows that if they, just as Moses said, if you walk away from me, if you add your commandments and take away commandments, if you disobey me, then curses will come upon you and the entire world will know that these curses came upon you because of your disobedience. However, that's not my will. My will is that you are obedient and that you reap the benefits and the whole world will know that you are my people, my disciples, my priests to the entire world. And so it is the Torah that Timothy is raised with from a youth. And then he went on to say that all scripture, what scripture is he talking about? He's talking about the Torah. The Torah is given by inspiration of God. It's theopneustos. It is God-breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, God may be artios, artios, perfect, truly exartizo, truly completely outfitted for the voyage in life. And that's how the Greeks use that word, artios and exartizo, as a ship, completely outfitted for its voyage, lacking absolutely nothing. And that is the foundation, that is the Torah, that's why it's been given, and it doesn't change. It's not been done away with, not one Vowel, not one consonant can be done away with. Yeshua himself cannot do away with and said specifically, don't even think about, you know, anything that you think I say, anything that anybody says I said, do not even let it enter your brainstem that I've come to destroy the Torah and the prophets. Absolutely not. He came to fulfill that which was written about him. He came to show us how to live the Torah that was what he did as the prophet that we must shema, we must hear and obey. He didn't come to do away with the commandments of the Almighty. He came to reinforce them and to juxtapose them, put a sword down between the rules and regulation of man-made religion and the everlasting commandments of the God of Israel. He came so that the Holy Spirit would then come and write the Torah on our heart. And as John says, anyone who willingly violates the Torah is none of his. He may say he knows God, may say he loves God, he says he is a liar, the truth is not in him, and that unfortunately is most of the religious world today. The truth is not in them, the Torah is not written in their heart, they made up their own religion. Well, we are going to go back to the scripture as it says in 2 Peter, we were in chapter three, another one of the verses that we were handling in the earlier sessions. And it says, even as our beloved brother Shaul, Paul, also according to the wisdom that's been given unto him, hath written unto you, and also in all his letters, his epistles, he speaks in them of these things of which he was referring to, in which some things are hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. Now, the, that word literally is torture. It is a metaphor, uh, you know, a metaphor meaning that, you know, to torture language. How do you torture language? You take his words, you twist them to make them say what you want them to say because the Torah is not written in your heart and you end up, as it says, they twist his words and torture his words, and they torture the other scriptures 
and they tortured them to their own destruction. We saw that Yeshua answered his religious critics and he said to them, you err not knowing the scriptures, the Torah, nor the power of God. And as the disciples talking to each other, after Yeshua appeared to them on the road to Emmaus and he had the quick dinner with them, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? He didn't open up the gospels, he didn't open up Paul's letters, he didn't open up the King James Version, he opened up the Torah. He opened up the prophets, he opened up the prophet David. Yes, David was a prophet. It was Peter on the day of, of Pentecost, Shavuot, that said David was a prophet who saw beforehand the coming of the Messiah, literally seeing the future, seeing the coming of the Messiah. It was David, Asaph the seer, Nathan the prophet, who put in place all the temple liturgy. They wrote the temple liturgy, what was to be done in the temple, all the rehearsals that were to be done, and David never saw the temple built. His son Solomon was the one that built the temple. But we see that in the time of Josiah, in the days of Hezekiah, when they had forsaken the Torah, and then they came back, and the Torah was lost, but then found in the temple, the dust-covered Torah, they read it, and they were weeping and crying and repenting. When they rediscovered the Torah and said, surely all these curses will come upon us, they repented, and it says they kept Passover according to all the ordinances, commandments of King David because David's commandments and ordinances concerning the temple service and how the Psalms were to be used as part of the temple service was all known, it was all part of that, and it was all put back in place, and so they celebrated and had a Passover like they had not done since coming out of Egypt. Well, as it says in Matthew 26, it says all these things were done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. The writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. We cannot forsake these things. As it says in Romans 15, four, again, Shaul, we go to his epistles, because again, he's a master of the Torah. And when we know where he's quoting from, then we know he's got him in context. And so many times, the King James translators have taken us away from the context uh, even, even though the Greek Septuagint and the Greek of his, and what's in his letters is identical, they don't put it together. Well, they didn't have that long to put the King James Version of the Bible together and it was done in three committees, okay? So, you know, I'd say it's the greatest work that's ever been done by a committee in the history of planet Earth, but there are things that could be done better and that's why we dig deeper and we correct the King James, as it's been corrected many times, we correct it to help us to understand it. He said, whatsoever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning, that we through patience, which is endurance, and comfort that we receive from the scriptures that we might have hope. We might see that finish line that was before us and that we can endure, and we can be comforted along the way. Because this journey in life is not always easy. Yeshua promised that we would, he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, but he also said that we would be persecuted and have tribulation as well. We would receive abundant blessings in this life, but with those blessings, there would be persecution. And that is where we get to know what he refers to as the fellowship of his sufferings. When we suffer wrongly for doing right, then there is a joy that is part of that by way of the Holy Spirit that we are given joy when we are persecuted for doing the right things. Of course, you know, most of us immediately start out thinking when we're persecuted, we're persecuted because we've done something stupid. Why? Because most of us have spent a lot of time doing stupid things in our lives that we've gotten the consequences for. But then all things change when we realize, no, I've been obedient, I've done what I'm supposed to do, and then what happens is heaven endorses and shows you you are exactly 
where you are supposed to be at this moment in time. He's brought other people to you for you to minister because if you hadn't gone through this trial, you wouldn't be able to help that person. And you realize that you have suffered so that you can help someone else. That is the fellowship of his sufferings and there is nothing more precious that you will ever experience in life than to know the Messiah which is in you, which is then leading you through the toughest times in your life. And that's when you know that you have an abundant life. As I say, this abundant life is not about material possessions. I hearken back, I should tell you this story, I was in Texas. And I was going to be teaching that night. I was staying at the home of a friend, a, a, a doctor and his wife. And I was upstairs, I was showering, and while I was in the shower, I was asking myself the question, why do I not see more miracles happen? And I'm talking out loud in the shower, kind of praying out loud, and I realized, and I said it, it's because I don't put myself in places where I can see more miracles happen. And I'm speaking this out loud. I don't put myself in places where I can see miracles happen. I got dressed, went downstairs to breakfast, the phone rang, and it was a couple in the hospital. Their two-year-old son, they woke up that day, and he was brain dead. Excuse me, it's happened the day before. No signs of life. It had happened in their family, different members of their family. Infant death said he's in the hospital. As soon as I heard it, I said, where is he? I'm going there. Because in that, in that moment, in that shower, because I haven't put myself in that position where I can see miracles happen. And so, they took me there. We drove 45 minutes, we got to the hospital. The hospital room was filled with people. They'd been praying for him. And the monitor showed flatline, brain dead can't breathe on his own, there's nothing there. And so I came in and we all prayed together and I, I got down on my knees and I put my head on this, on this child's chest and I prayed for him and I prayed. And doctors and nurses came in because they know what's next. They know that if a miracle doesn't happen, they're gonna have to unplug this baby. And I prayed and I, as I was praying, I was hearkening back to other times where I was up in Duluth, Minnesota, and the mother of one a close friend up there who's been a wonderful support of the ministry and just a, a support to me through the years, the doctors uh, did an operation on her and didn't realize that she was on blood thinners and she bled out. And when I found out about it, I went to the hospital and and I took my prayer shawl and, and we asked everyone to leave the room and I was there with, with another friend and we put a prayer shawl on her and we, we prayed for her and I had to walk out 15 minutes later, she never got up and this is all going through my mind and I'm just praying, I'm crying out, please raise this child, raise this child. And when it was all done, They unplugged that little two-year-old boy and put him in the grave. I'm giving you that example because when I walked out of there, I said, okay, we didn't see it, but Yeshua said that we can raise the dead. I've seen it before. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen the dead raised. Why it didn't happen, I can't answer that. But to be there, to know that we have the authority and we have been given the commission if we put ourselves in those places, that the Almighty sees that act of faith. And we don't know what the entire plan is, but I know when I walked out of there, even though I wept and, and I, I think so often of that situation in the and the, the pain in the heart of the mother and the father and the sisters and the brothers and everyone that was there when they had to unplug that child. And, and, but yet, this is the abundant life. To know that Yeshua said that greater works than he did, we will be able to do. That we are to grow up in the fullness and stature of Messiah. 
And I know that when I go to Africa, and when I'm in South America, when I'm in places where they don't have the scientific hospitalization, they don't have the heroic intervention that we can enjoy here in the United States of America, that, that their faith and their believing, that is where we see more miracles happen than, than we've ever seen happen in the United States. It's because it's necessary, because there's no other way that they can live. Yeshua said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify me. It's the Torah, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the other writings. They are the ones that testify of Yeshua. And that is exactly what Shaul used. That's exactly what Apollos used to convince the Jews in the synagogues that Yeshua is the Messiah. And synagogue after synagogue, the leaders of the synagogue and the Jewish believers that were living in those pagan countries came to a knowledge of Yeshua. They turned the world upside down in the first century. We read about this in Acts chapter 17. As it says that Paul, as his manner was, went into the synagogue and three Sabbath days, he reckoned with them, reasoned with them out of the scriptures, the scriptures that testify of Yeshua, opening alleging that Messiah must needed to have suffered. It was required and that he rose again from the dead and this Yeshua that he was preaching is literally the Messiah. He is the prophet. He is the one that fulfilled the prophecy. See, the Jews have a context for this that is unknown to most of the world. Most of the Christian world, all they know about Mount Sinai is the movie, The Ten Commandments, if they ever got to watch it. Cecil B. DeMille took 15 chapters and boiled it down into five minutes. But I need to give you a little bit more background on this and why it is that the Messiah needed to have suffered and why he was raised from the dead. When we were all brought to Mount Sinai, we were there at the first of the month. And then we were, Moses went up into the mountain and the Almighty spoke to him and said, go down to the people and ask them this question. First of all, tell them, you have seen that I was your savior. I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. I parted the Red Sea. You've seen that I'm your savior now. Will you make me Lord? Will you obey me? Will you keep my commandments? If you will, you will be a treasured people. You'll be my segula, my treasure. You'll be a nation of priests. You'll be my prophets to the world. Moses came down, gathered us together, and we said, we didn't say, well, give us a sample of these commandments, we'll get back to you. No, we had to agree before we heard the fine print. We had no idea what we were gonna be commanded, but we knew that he was our savior. Now, we have to make the decision. Will we obey him? Will we make him Lord? This is very important when it comes to Yeshua. It says, as Shaul says, Romans 10, 9 and 10, this is the word of faith that we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Yeshua, not the Savior, not the fire escape from hell, not that Jesus is gonna save you, no, the Lord, that you will do what he says, and then believe in your heart that God hath raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved with one word in Greek, and sozo thane, thou shalt in the future be saved. When the captain of our salvation comes back and saves us, rescues us, takes our dead molded body from the grave and gives us a new body or transforms our mortal body into immortality. That's when he saves us. That's when we're literally saved. But here at Mount Sinai, you've seen that I was your savior. I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now will you keep my commands? We said everything the Almighty says, we promise we will do. Moses returns the words of the people to Yahweh. He says, come back down, tell the people to get ready for three days. And on the third day, when they hear the trumpets blow, gather them to the base of the mountain. Cordon it off, don't let anyone touch this mountain. Not even an animal. If an animal goes up on it, take a spear and kill him. Do not step on this mountain. So the morning of the third day, the earth shook. The mountain trembled. 
and the fire of Almighty God came down on that mountain and trumpets began blowing that were so loud it actually fractured the mountain. It fractured the rocks, the earth shook, and Moses said, follow me, and brought us up to the base of that mountain. There, when they got to the base of the mountain, the trumpet stopped. Moses called out to the Most High and the Almighty shouted down, Moses, come up hither, come up here. And Moses walked right up into the middle of that blast furnace. The Almighty told Moses, I'm gonna do something on that day that from then on, nobody in Israel will doubt your word. They will believe in you. That was it. When Moses was called by name to walk up into that furnace of a mountain, he needed no more endorsements on his personal resume. This was a man tight with the Almighty. Moses goes up, and the Almighty says, okay, now go down, tell the people to come up closer, but don't break through, you know, this is not a sight to see. Bring him up closer, put up at the base of the mountain, and then it says the Almighty shouted down these 10 statements, these 10 commandments. And when the 10th commandment was shouted down, the people said, please, please, Moses, we are afraid we're gonna die. Please do not have the Almighty speak to us. You go up in the mountain and, and hear from the Almighty whatever he says, do come down and tell us and we promise we'll obey, but do not make us stand here and listen to this. We are afraid we're gonna die. Moses goes up into the mountain, the Almighty. He then later relates in Deuteronomy, he said, they've well spoken that which they have spoken. I will speak to you, Moses. You go down and tell them, but they must obey every word that you say. And then I'm gonna send another prophet in the future because they're not gonna obey. And that prophet, they must shema. He will hear directly from me and speak nothing but what I tell him to speak. Deuteronomy 18, the prophet. So, Moses then, for the next couple of chapters, is given more detail. He comes down, and then he writes those words on a scroll. Then he orders the Levites to sacrifice bulls. Take half of the blood and put it on the altar. Take the other half and put it in basins. Bring me branches of hyssop. And Moses, all day long in the heat of the day, dips the branches of hyssop in that blood and sprinkles the people with the blood. He sprinkles the book that he wrote with blood. He sprinkles the altar with blood. And he says, this is the blood covenant. You are entering into a blood covenant with the Almighty. You said you would obey. And what the blood covenant is, ladies and gentlemen, is whoever breaks that covenant is as dead as the animal with which blood you were sprinkled. If the Almighty breaks his covenant with Israel, he dies. If Israel breaks the covenant, they die. This is the blood covenant. Now, Moses and the elders were called up to eat a meal in the presence of the Almighty on that sapphire blue sea. And then Moses was told, come back up into the mountain and I'm gonna give you these commandments written in stone, these 10 statements written in stone. Moses goes then up into the mountain. For 40 days, he is up there. The next several chapters, he is given the detail on building the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the very first item, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the, the menorah, all these things. And then finally, Nine chapters later, 40 days later, the Almighty then reiterates the importance of the Sabbath for six verses and then gives Moses the tables of stone written with the finger of the Almighty. The Almighty said, get down there, there's trouble. Moses went down and saw that they had built a golden calf. The Almighty said, stand back, Moses, I'm gonna kill them all. I'll start over with you. I'm gonna kill them all right now, stand back. Moses said, no, no, you're not gonna start over with me. I'm tired, I'm 80 years old. You're not gonna do it, figure something else out. You know what? The Almighty figured something else out. He said, okay, what you're gonna do, the people are gonna sacrifice bulls and goats and lambs and rams. 
every feast they go up to, year after year, century after century, they are gonna do that because they owe the death penalty. And this is a constant reminder that they owe the death penalty. They broke the blood covenant, the sentence is death, that's why I said stand back because I'm gonna kill them all and start over. You want another plan? Here's the other plan. And that plan is they are gonna be constantly reminded that the death penalty is owed. And the only way it can be paid is with the death of the offending party, unless someone who never breaks the covenant dies in the place of the guilty party. I'm opening and I'm alleging that Yeshua is the one who never broke that covenant. That he willingly died in place of the guilty party. He paid the death penalty and by the grace of Almighty God, by faith, we simply accept that substitution. No, he was not a human sacrifice. He willingly died in place of the guilty party. And then, as David, who was a prophet, who saw before the hand the coming of the Messiah, he saw his, his son, his son, the offspring of David, that his body would not see corruption, that he would not be left in the grave, and that he would become the high priest forever, the Kohen Gadol forever, after the order of the Malik Zadik. Not after the Aaronic priesthood, but after the priesthood that preceded and supersedes the Aaronic priesthood. And the only way that could happen to be the high priest forever is that he must never die. So Yeshua, when he was raised, was raised forever to be the high priest forever. This is Yeshua, the prophet who put the plumb line down, who told us what we needed to do, how to live it, how to live the Torah, and said, follow me. He is the one that never violated the Torah, but he died in the place of the guilty party. And now, he says, follow me because we've got some work to do. Members of the synagogue in Thessalonica put up with it for about three days, but after that, they started to turn a little bit. And so 
Later on in the same chapter, in verse 11 of chapter 17, Shaul then moved on to Berea, and he found that they were actually more noble than those Jews in Thessalonica, because they received the word with all readiness of mind, and then they searched the scriptures, and they did it daily to find out whether those things were so. I grew up in America in a completely different time frame, and this was when seven days a week we got together every single night and we studied the scriptures for about three hours a night. That fellowship went on for years, seven days a week, two, three, sometimes four, five hours every night. We were younger back then, didn't have children, but this went on for more than a decade, and that searching the scriptures daily and proving these things out from Genesis to Revelation and putting these things together, this has somehow been supplanted by different technology today to where we have so many conveniences we don't have time to really study the scriptures. And that is why I'm doing this class for you to teach you how to understand the Bible so that you can read it for yourself. And as you go through it, you will understand and see those keys as you apply them and understand that the holy scriptures will give you the information that you need, the knowledge of the true God, so that you will have the power to live an abundant life. We are to live a power-filled, abundant life. This is why Yeshua came, it has to be available to us, and that is what we are going to press toward. The synagogue in Berea had people there that really studied the scriptures. They studied them every day, they're studying the Torah, they're studying the prophets, and when Shaul taught, that is where the fire was lit in Berea. Shaul writes to the believers in Corinth. Now this is uh, at a much different time, and the problem with the, the letters that we have to the believers in Corinth is that there's a lot of problems going on, and we do not have their letters to Shaul that he is answering. And so we can only try to piece together what's going on because of his responses. It'd be nice to have their letter to him and then his letter back, but, but in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, this is where Yeshua is, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Paul, Shaul, is laying out some things concerning Yeshua. And in verse three we read, for I delivered unto you, and this is why I was there teaching them, first of all, that which I received, how that Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures. According to what scriptures? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No, of course, they didn't exist. Nothing about Paul's writings. It's according to the Torah and according to the prophets. This is what he laid out to them. And they received this, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. So there must be a legal precedent for him to be able to die for our sins or in the place of this our sins. See, the curse of the law is death. When we violate the law, when we violate God's instructions, we bring upon us the death penalty. That is the curse of the law. And Yeshua took the curse of the law. It's not that the laws are curse, our violating the Torah is what brings a curse. Again, simple semantics, simple usage of words. The law is not a curse. The curse of the law is the death penalty incurred for violating the blood covenant. And so that we see that there is a legal precedent that is set, that the death penalty that we owed, that was temporarily covered, but covered only by the sacrifice of bulls and goats and lambs and rams, which is not sufficient to take away sin. If the sacrifice of a bull could take away the death penalty for us, then wonderful, but it's a constant reminder, and this is what is spoken so eloquently in the book of Hebrews 
that it's not possible for the for the sacrifice of these animals to take away our sin. It's, it's impossible. It's simply a reminder of the death penalty that is owed. But once that death penalty was paid willingly by Yeshua and he died for our sins, then he was seated at the right hand of God forever to make intercession. It is finished. The sacrifices for that transgression are satisfied. And then, It says in verse four, and that he was buried, Yeshua was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, right here, we we come back to the Jonah Code, of which I've done a 10-hour video on the Jonah Code, which has really been a life-changing experience, especially for pastors and teachers out there, those who have gone on to higher education because they really could not figure out and had the same question I presented when I was in second grade and was going out of the church at Green Corners Baptist Church, shaking hands with the pastor as we left uh, to go home on Easter Sunday to eat our our ham dinner on Easter Sunday, as the Babylonian tradition was. And I said, "Uh, Pastor, how do you get three days and three nights between Good Friday and Easter Sunday? Now, Later on, I could have more fully articulated that. Uh, I could have said, Pastor, how do you get three days and three nights between Good Friday when Dagon, the Syrian fish god, is worshiped, why we're eating fish on Friday in public school in Michigan, and Easter Sunday when Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, after dying, ascended into heaven, the gods named her the queen of heaven, sent her back to the earth in a giant egg on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. And when the egg plummeted in the Euphrates River, out emerged Semiramis, reincarnated as Easter, the bare-breasted sex goddess who turned a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. Pastor, how do you get three days and three nights with Yeshua rising on the third day between Good Friday, late in the afternoon before sun, uh, before sundown, and Sunday, before the sun comes up, he's already gone? How do you do that? Well, the answer of my pastor back then, through the next 20 years, never got more intelligent. It was like, duh, uh, 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 what difference does it make? What difference does it make? The most repeated prophecy in all of the Bible. Yeshua said it more than any other thing. He said there's one sign and only one sign of his authenticity. One sign that you've got the real Messiah. Not an imposter. One sign, and it's the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the great fish's belly, so he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, dead, buried in the grave, and raised on the third day. How do you get three days and three nights and yet raised on the third day? Elementary, you have to start counting with night because you put in the grave just before the high Sabbath, as it says, the day of preparation for Passover and the high Sabbath, he was put in the grave just before sunset. So that was the first night. Then the next day was the first day. Second night, second day, third night the third day raised on the third day. Now, you can't do it between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Those are the two high holy days of Babylonian pagan sun god worship. The things the Almighty calls abominations, twelve on shakets, do not do it, do not have other gods in my face, do not learn the way of the heathen, do not learn how they worship, serve their gods, and do the same thing, say you're doing it to me because it is an abomination. It is so utterly disgusting, don't do it. But yet, this is what we inherited. And just as Jeremiah said, all we have to do is repent. We inherited it, and you can't do anything about what you inherited. All you can do, if you have a love for the truth, you can come out of the fog. If not, go back to church, any church, Buddhist, Baptist, Methodist, Muslim, Catholic, Krishna, it doesn't matter. Just go out there and be religious. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter unless you really want the truth and really want to follow Yeshua. If you want a power-filled, abundant life, it's based on obedience. Obedience. First of all, the simple obedience, the written Torah. That's to be written on our heart. And then the exciting stuff comes 
when Yeshua then communicates with you directly and you are doing the will of the Father, that is the abundant life. There is nothing better, I guarantee you. In verse five, it goes on to say, as he rose again the third day according to the scripture, then he was seen of uh, Cephas, it's literally Kepha, Kepha, that's what his Hebrew name is, it's uh, not, not Petros, but Kepha. Then of the 12, his real name was Shimon, but Yeshua had a brother named Shimon, so he said, I'm gonna call you Kepha, that's fine. No ambiguity. Then verse six, after that, after he's seen by Kepha, then of the 12, remember it was the, the 12, the two on the road to Emmaus, and then he went back and appeared to, to the 12. After that, he was seen ab uh, by above, or more than, would be more accurately used in the English language now, above is this way, more than 500 brethren at one time, of whom the greater part remain to this day, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of Yaakov, James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me. And again, when you see the word of, you, you have to, it could be a number of prepositions. It was seen by me also, as of one born out of due time. In other words, he came along later, this is the road on his way to Damascus, Yeshua appeared to him and gave him instructions, he appeared to him. He's saying, I literally saw Yeshua, and uh, Yeshua has been seen through the ages. And the, the most reports that we're getting right now, appearing to Muslims, Yeshua literally appearing to Muslims, and they becoming believers, and a lot of them don't last very long. They are killed by their family, because they, they, can't, they can't have Yeshua or one of their own exposing their fairy tale religion that was invented by one guy, okay? And then he says that, uh, that, that he's the least of the apostles, least of the sent ones. He's not even qualified to be called a sent one because of his persecution. He killed the, the believers. But he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. In his grace, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. See, by the grace of God, that divine empowerment, it's not, it's just not do whatever you want, just go kill people, you know, his grace covers you, no. But by the divine empowerment of God, I am what I am today. And by his divine empowerment, which was bestowed upon me, it wasn't in vain, but I labored more abundantly than all of them. And he's saying that, you know, yet it's, it's not really me, it's the grace of God, that divine empowerment which was with me that did the work, that did the labor. See, grace can never be tortured to mean license or any form of it. I know that it's commonly used in the English language now, but never allow hen or chesed to be used as license or permission or greasy grace, sloppy agape, no. It's divine empowerment. Listen to Shaul and how he uses it. Then he says in Galatians, the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Yeshua Messiah might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. We were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, wherefore, why for the wherefore? This is why the Torah was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Messiah, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are all the children of God by faith in Yeshua Messiah. Let, let's go through this again. The scripture has revealed that we are all completely encompassed under the death penalty of sin. That is what the context is. Conclude us all under sin, okay? We are completely encompassed under the death penalty of sin. And it has revealed us that 
so that the promise by believing in the substitution of the death penalty by Yeshua might be given to those that simply believe. But before that promise by faith came, we were, what, what does it say? We were shut up? No, it's the same word, we were being protected under the provisions of the Torah completely encompassed and guarded, same word, protected, completely encompassed and guarded, looking forward to the faith which would afterward would be revealed. It is for this reason that the Torah was our schoolmaster, Paideagogos, the tutor of little children. Listen carefully. It's for this reason that the Torah was our tutor the tutor of little children to bring us to Messiah, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith came, we are no longer under the tutor of little children because we are all the, not the children of God, we are all the wheels, we are all the sons of God by faith in Yeshua Messiah. We're no longer little babies who have to be protected, but we don't forget the lessons we learned as little children. The Torah didn't change. Sin is still the violation of the Torah, but we are no longer in bondage to sin. We are no longer under the death penalty for breaking the blood covenant. We are now mature sons who are supposed to grow up and walk in the fullness and stature of Yeshua Messiah. We are supposed to grow up and do greater works than he did because he is now in us and has all power in heaven and earth to orchestrate such works from the throne room in heaven. We are no longer under schoolmaster, under the tutor of little children. I have a friend, well, in fact, I have two friends. One is a pilot with the US Air Force, fighter pilot, and the other is a fighter pilot in the IDF. Neither one of them were allowed to touch the controls of a fighter, they sat in there, they watched the pilots, they were under a tutor, they couldn't touch anything. And then after two years, they were unleashed. They were no longer under a tutor, but do you think they then just made up their own rules? Oh, I think I can take 20 G-forces Oh, I think I can bend this plane in half. I think I can break all the, no. One plus one with the tutor still remains one plus one when you're given the controls of the plane. It doesn't change. The schoolmaster's lessons don't change. In Bertrand Russell's Principia Mathematica, it took him 234 pages of calculations to prove that one plus one equals two. 235 pages of advanced mathematical calculations to prove that one plus one equals two. This is something you learn in first grade, but yet it took a mathematical, almost a genius, if we weren't so, his philosophy so messed up, I'd call him a genius, can't call him that almost a genius, took him that much to prove it. See, that doesn't change. One plus one equals two. We can do advanced math off that, but this is the standard. Once that standard was set, now he was ready to do mathematics. So now the question is, ladies and gentlemen, how did we get the word? All scripture, let's start with the Torah, was given by inspiration of God, Theopneustos. Let's go to 2 Peter, we'll begin there. 2 Peter chapter one, in verse 12, and this is where he says right here, wherefore, why for the wherefore? For this reason I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and you are established in the present truth. But I'm gonna tell you why I need you to put in remembrance of these things, because I think it is meet, I think it's proper 
as long as I'm in this tabernacle, this earthly body, to stir you up and to put you in remembrance of these things because I know that soon I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as the Lord, Yeshua Messiah, has shown me. He told me by revelation that I'm gonna die. And so as long as I'm in this body, I'm going to push this thing home because you need to understand where we are. This is near the end of the first century. Shaul said all those who were in Asia had forsaken him. Demoth had forsaken me. You know, things were, were out of control because evil men had crept in and turned the grace of God into license. And Peter says, moreover, I am going to endeavor that you may be able, after I am dead, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. And that's why we have his words, ladies and gentlemen. Take these and learn from them. These are the last words of Peter. Do not treat them lightly. He said, because we have not followed cunningly devised fables, and you're gonna find for the rest of the chapter, this is what others had done, so-called ministers. And they did it in order to take advantage of people. They are con artists, they are rip-off artists. The television is filled with them today, ladies and gentlemen. Our window of opportunity, even for being on the internet, is a short-lived thing that you better take advantage of and and stand with me to help because we don't have long for this world. We have not followed cunningly devised fables like others did when we made known unto you the power and the personal presence of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We didn't make things up. These others, they're making things up all the time. They're doing things to tickle your ears. Oh, they're getting you to follow little rabbinic things so that you feel Jewish and you put on a little kippah that says that you're under the authority of the rabbis and you know they, they do all these things. They'll sell you a tallit uh, on, their, on their television program, but they won't be obedient to the commandments. They just, these things sell. And people, if they feel a little Jewish, you know, it's a, oh, you know, it, it makes them feel warm and fuzzy if they do little Jewish things. No, we, we're not pulling this kind of stunt. We didn't do this. When we made known to you the power and the personal presence of Yeshua Messiah, we were eyewitnesses because we received from God the Father, for he, excuse me, he was the one that received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him, from the excellent glory that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this is a voice that we heard from heaven when we were with them in the holy mountain. You know, the whole mountain of transfiguration scenario that took place on the day of atonement before they went up to the Feast of Tabernacles. We were there, we heard it. He said, don't tell anyone. And this is when Peter is making it known. We heard it and I'm telling you, we heard that voice. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We didn't make it up. We also have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well to take heed. Like you sh- light that shines into a dark place until the day dawns and the day star of the sun arises in your heart. This more sure word of prophecy, we received it from Yeshua himself. You better listen to us in what we're saying because we're going to expose all of the darkness and it's going to be a light that shines into the darkness of this generation all the way to the end. Knowing this first, and this is the first thing that you have to understand, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You don't make it up and any prophecy in the scripture It is not of any private interpretation. Knowing this first, the very first thing that you have to know before anything else, that no prophecy of the scripture. Now prophecy is not always foretelling the future. It's either foretelling or foretelling. Any declaration of the nature of God, like the Torah, his instructions, it reveals who he is, it is his nature, it is who he is, it's what he expects of us. It says what is an abomination, what is disgusting and putrid him and what we're not to do and what we are to do. It is how we love him and how we love our neighbor as ourselves. That prophet 
prophetic voice, the declaration of the Almighty is not of any private interpretation. The word private is idios, from which we get the word idiot. It means one's own. Interpretation is epilusis, one's own letting loose. That's the first thing you have to understand, that what we receive, we receive from heaven. And conversely, on the other hand, those who make up these cunningly devised fables, what they are doing is these idiots are just letting their mind loose and interpreting things according to whatever comes to their mind, thinking that you're so stupid that you are going to follow them. Because the prophecy came not in old time, literally in the Greek, at any time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We are going to go into the depth of this, understanding that these cunningly devised fables that turned everything away in the first century, we are gonna go back and earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. We are going to go back to the revelation and we are not going to let our idiocy loose. We are going to very carefully let the scripture interpret itself so that we do not destroy ourselves because we lack a knowledge of the Torah or the power of God, because we want to live a power-filled, abundant life. Where do you think you're going? You're not done yet. You gotta subscribe if you wanna see more of this stuff. Just click the button up here. Better yet, you can click here to watch more right now. And if you like what you see, support what we do. Donate here to keep the broadcast coming. Thank you.